to the broken and to the hurting, to the desperate and to the defeated, to the common, the average, the plain and the small, I want you to know you matter to God. To the washed up and the worn out, to the helpless and the hopeless, to the cast outs, the dropouts, the last picks and hypocrites, to the unimpressive and the underwhelming, to the nobodies and has-beens, to people just like me, you matter to God. You are not defined by your worst days or your biggest mistakes. And you are not the sum total of all your setbacks, slip-ups, failures, and faults. Because who you are is not determined by what you have, where you've been, or what you've done, but who Jesus declares you to be. You matter to God. Maybe at some point somebody told you something that simply wasn't true. That you're nothing but unworthy, unwanted, and unloved. But I want the loudest voice in your ear to be the voice that breaks the cedars and shakes the wilderness. And he says, you matter to me. Before the galaxies were born, or the first star gave light, before the ocean waves crashed or the night sky cracked with thunder, before any creature crawled or any bird sang, before the planets were set in motion, he set in motion the plan of your salvation. From the highest heights of heaven, the Lord of all creation looked upon your desperation. He became like one of us to remake all of us, to make an orphan his child, to make a rebel his friend, to set the prisoner free. You matter to God. So to all the sons and daughters of God, to all my brothers and sisters in Christ, behold his power and glory and majesty. Behold the one who matters most. As we hear those powerful truths resonate in this room, resonate maybe in your living room. There's some other powerful truths I want you to hold on to because of where we're going to go in the scripture and in the message. There's some things we need to hold on to. And so in that, in light of who God is, the one who matters most, who tells you that you matter to him, let's see, let's ex- just remind ourselves once more who this God is. And so I know you're sitting maybe right now, but if you'd, you'd humor me and stand one more time, And let's confess the faith God gives us because of who he is in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, let's confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and he rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And I hope it it becomes clear why we do that uh, because of what we're going to read right now. So we're going into Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. And uh, we hear, we pick up the story with Jesus. Now he's, he's leaving Jerusalem. He's going to a place called Tyre and Sidon. And all you need to know is that that's north of Jerusalem where Gentiles or people who are not Jewish live. So he's, he's going there. and From there he rose and Jesus went on his way, went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he entered the house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman who, whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is, right, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Whew. 
But she answered him, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Decapolis. And, he retur- and he, they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, touched his tongue. Because COVID wasn't a thing back then. And looked up to heaven. He sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But, more, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word about Jesus from Mark chapter 7. I want to go back to Jesus' encounter with a woman. You know, the part where he called her a dog. That doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? When someone who's desperate comes to him begging to have him remove the demon, we normally see Jesus have a discussion with the person and then he does his thing. He doesn't quite do that here. And I don't know if you've had an experience with God where you've, you've asked him for something, you've pleaded, well, you've begged God, and you've been met with a no, or a harsh no, or silence. Like this woman received. What do you do when God doesn't act like he's supposed to act, like you expect him to behave? What do you do when God hides himself? Because it's real easy to start asking questions like, why are you doing this, God? Uh, if, do, do I matter to you? And if, if I don't matter, who matters to you, God? Let's pray. Jesus, it's your word. Your word that speaks to us about who you are. That reveals to us the depth of your love and your grace and everything that you show us that you are. Lord, speak to our hearts again. Help us not only to be held by your promises, but Lord, give us the faith and teach us how to hold on to those promises for dear life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So when God hides, and there, don't get me wrong, there are some times where it seems like God is far away. There are some times where it seems like God doesn't hear. And then there are times where God is far away, where you don't get a response to your prayer. There it's met with silence. We see this a couple times in Scripture. Between Genesis and the book of Exodus, towards the beginning of God's Word, the Bible, there's 400 years between, then, between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. And then, at the end of the prophets, Malachi is the last prophet we hear from. And then there's 400 years, and then Jesus So God being silent is something he does. God being hidden is something he does. He hides himself in his opposite. And it wasn't just the Syrophoenician woman. By the way, put that on your spelling list for the week. If you want extra credit, Syrophoenician woman. We'll dig into that in just a second. But it wasn't just this woman who experienced this aspect of God. 
We can go back to Abraham and what he experienced when he experienced God's hiddenness and a command he received. We can go to Psalm 10, where David writes these words in verse 1. He writes, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Right? He's not seeming far away. God is standing far away. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The very moment I need you, God, you are hidden to me. I can't find you. Where are you? What do you do when you're asking those questions? Why is this happening to me? God, where are you? Don't you hear me? Don't I matter to you? A Syrophoenician woman, all right, so we're digging into her for a second. Syro meaning Assyria, one of the conquering kingdoms God used to infiltrate and conquer many kingdoms, including Israel at one point. And then Phoenicia, uh, which is the region of that Tyre and Sidon was in, sometimes referred to by scholars as Old Phoenicia, all right? Um, and so there's this woman there outside the people of God. She's a Gentile, which means, Gentile, that word means other nations, basically. Anyone who's not Israel, who's not Jewish, okay? So she is outside of God's people. Probably didn't grow up with the scriptures, at least not the way Jewish people grew up with them. And yet, somehow, she's heard about Jesus. She knows the stories. She knows who he is. Enough that when he's on her, her community front porch, he's in the region, he's there, she has to go see him because she believes and because she is desperate for her daughter. A quick word about uh, this little girl and, and younger children in particular. Right? There's, there's games you play with, with young kids, right? And it makes them giggle, right? And to me, that is, man, there is nothing like just a full belly laugh from a baby or a younger kid, just where they don't even care. They're just laughing. They're so filled with joy. And one of the ways that happens sometimes is when you play peekaboo with them, right? Or when they get a little bit older, you play hide and seek. Now, and when you play hide and seek with them, you have to hide pretty obviously, Right? Because if you really hide, if you like tuck yourself in a closet where a place they can't get to, they'll start freaking out on you, right? They'll start crying and it won't be fun anymore. But something you teach them through those, those peekaboo and simple hide and seek games is a concept called object permanence. That just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's not there. And so the Syrophoenician woman is going to see Jesus. And she tells him exactly what she needs. She begs him. Have you ever begged God for something? Healing. Maybe saving the life of someone. When have you begged God for something? She was begging Jesus for this, pouring her heart out for him to heal her, her, her young daughter. And she, uh, she was possessed by a demon, an unclean spirit, right? And this wasn't, this is not a, a, a tongue-in-cheek statement. There, there are some times like where I say, I swear, my son must be possessed by the devil. He's not actually, right? He's just, he's feeling all the power God has given him and using it probably for something he shouldn't be. But that's not what she's talking about. Le legitimately, her daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit, a, a dark spirit. Now, to understand what's happening with Jesus and this woman here in Mark chapter 7, verse 24, you got to understand, you got to go back to Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. I know I'm a little out of shot. Sorry, camera people. Um, and those of you viewing online, I hope you're, you're still with me. But you got to go back to Mark chapter 7, verse 23, because in that, Jesus is talking to two different sets of people. The Pharisees, who know God's word and his promises backwards and forwards, and his disciples, who have spent a good chunk of time on the road with Jesus. And they're fighting with him about what? What makes people clean and unclean? 
And the Pharisees contend, and so this, these are the fair, same Pharisees that have learned all the same lessons that the disciples know, that what makes someone unclean is what they eat, or what they experience, or what they touch. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not it. It's what comes from within you that makes you unclean. I make me unclean. You make you unclean. All right, I'm shifting back to the middle now. As we're getting back to the story. And so Jesus leaves Jerusalem. He leaves that conversation and he goes up north to Tyre and Sidon, right? So on Labor Day weekend, where many of you are up north, what is Jesus going to do? He's going up north to rest, to get away. And yet even in his rest, people know who he is. He can't hide. And so this woman comes to him and he responds to her, what? Well, now, how would you respond if you had just had a fight with some religious leaders and the, pe- the guys who have been following you for a while now, they don't understand what you're doing and you just want to get away, you need a chance to breathe. Teachers who have been teaching already, can I get an amen? All right, no teachers here today. They must all be up north too, getting a rest. All right, so Jesus answers her and says, Children need to eat first. It's not appropriate to share their food, their bread, with the dogs, with the family pets. Yikes. Now, we don't know Jesus' tone, right? Because sometimes tone can change everything. You know, between it, me and a conversation, Jerry, I'm going to call you out, brother. People know, if people know Jerry, uh, they know your sarcasm, right? Anyone know Jerry? Say an Amen. <laughs> All his family just said amen right there. All right? And so there are some times, there's some things you say, we say to each other sarcastically that we know we don't mean. And so was Jesus being sarcastic with this woman who's pouring her heart out to him? Or is he just exhausted and he wants to be left alone? Because he's true God, but he is also true man. And true man gets exhausted. But what he's really saying to her is, you're not from the children of Israel. You're not from the people of Israel who rejected God and then because they rejected God, God rejected them and sent them away. You're not from the children of Israel. You're not the one that God gave his promises to, promises to redeem them, to restore them, to call them and bring them back home. You're you're not from those people. I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus is pouring a lot into this metaphor. But here's the thing. She gets it. Right? The woman understands exactly what Jesus is saying. She knows she's a Gentile. She knows she's not from the, the people of God. But yet she believes these promises are for her. So that even when she is distraught and devastated because something was going on with her daughter that she can't explain and no one else can help her. She can only go to Jesus and she actually goes to Jesus. She finds him and he rebuffs her. He calls her a dog. She says, I don't even care because you have what I need and I need a little something, even if it's just a crumb. God, I need something from you. When faith holds you, nothing else matters. Not your circumstances, not your sin or the sin that's happening around you. When faith is holding on to you, all you care about is Jesus. And him hearing your prayer and meeting your need. The woman believes. She believes God when she speaks. She, I don't know if she knows God's promises, but the promise God spoke to Abraham when he said, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And I'm pretty sure she, she wasn't in on the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus that we know is recorded in John chapter three, where he says, Jesus says this, for God so loved. Okay, 11 o'clock, come on. For God so loved the world, the nations, the Gentiles, 
his people and all other people. She believes these promises are for her. And this is something that everybody, the Pharisees and the disciples who should have known better, didn't understand. But the woman up north, she knew. And so God hears and he heals, not because she's persistent, but because she believes. She's held by faith and God is teaching her to hold on to those promises. And so we see in Mark chapter 7, verse 29. And he said to her, because of this answer, go your way. The demon, what? Will go out of your daughter? No. I'm taking the demon out of your daughter? No. The demon has gone out. It's already done. It's happened. And she went home and found it, just as Jesus said. And then we have another story about Jesus healing a, a mute and deaf man. But I gotta imagine that man, those people, and this woman and her daughter have got to be experiencing something similar. Now, they probably weren't familiar with Psalm 10. Maybe they were, I don't know. But remember Psalm 10 where David started out writing, where are you, God? Why are you hiding yourself when in the midst of trouble? He writes, same Psalm, he writes these words. The Lord is king forever and ever, and nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desires of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. We need a new question. Because when we're in trouble and we start asking, why God? Why would you let this happen? Why do you let bad things happen to good people? Why, why, why? We are seeking to understand God. And sometimes there are parts of God that we are not going to understand. And so why actually only takes us further away from God? Because we're focusing on things that aren't for us. Why does not help us? Which is why there's no answer to that question. There is an answer to the question, where? Where do you go to be reminded of what's true? Where do you go to be taught about what is true? You see, the woman didn't ask why. She didn't ask, why would you say that, Jesus? I'm not a dog. (laughs) She agreed with him. She said, yes, indeed. She knew his mission was to the people of God. She also believed that God had something for the world as well. And yet, even her response demonstrated that even this hope in God was too small. Right? Because her question, her her insistence was about crumbs. Give me something. (laughs) And Jesus, Jesus gives her everything. God gives you everything. So the question is not why, but where. Where can I go for relief, for forgiveness, for acceptance, for healing, for patience? Where do I go to hear you speak, God, when you're silent? God continually continually reveals an answer to this question. We need preachers. We need preachers to declare these truths of God to us. And pastors, when we're doing our thing and we're doing it well and we're speaking, we're not just talking about God, but we're speaking for God, we're preachers. And I hope that's what you hear from us when we're up here, when we're online or when we're in studies. But Jesus, but the, this woman didn't just hear about Jesus from Jesus. Someone else told her about him. Someone else was a preacher to her. Someone else told her about this Jesus who heals and forgives. It could probably answer 
be the answer for what she needs. We need preachers, we need people. There's a world of people out there. When we think about the troubles that are going on in this world, like Afghanistan, like North Korea, like other, any number of countries where it seems like God has forsaken them. Or we get to places a little closer to home, communities where injustice is reigning instead of fairness and God's goodness. Where it seems like there is always a lack and never enough. And maybe you don't have to go down the street to see that. Maybe you are experiencing that in your own home, in your own soul. You need a preacher. I need a preacher to remind me of these truths. That God's promises, even when he is hidden and I can't see him and I don't hear from him and he's not there, his promises are true. His promises hold me in faith. They hold you in faith. So there are two things I want you to know at the end of all this. Like the woman who received a harsh response from Jesus, Believe. Believe in the promises of God. Believe that even when God himself is hiding in his opposite, he is faithful. He is true. That's why we started with the creed, right? Reflecting, reminding ourselves all over with who God is. And we start with that at the beginning of the week. So the rest of the week, when we have everything that tells us we're not enough and we don't have it and and There's lots of reason to doubt. God is who he says he is. He is faithful. He is good. He is present. His promises are true. So believe. The second is just as important as the first. And it answers the whole question we started this out with, right? You matter to God. Let's pray.